Good afternoon. I'm Helen Rinsberg, president of the Cincinnati Asian Art Society, cast to our friends. Today's talks is Felix Biato's Photographic Views and Costumes of Japan, the Art and Business of Photography in Yokohama, about 1863 to 1873. In 1863, Beato arrived in Yokohama, Japan's first open treaty port. His camera captured the beginning of great political, social, and cultural changes. Reproduced in many newspapers and travel publications, his portraits, genre works, landscapes, and cityscapes helped shape European ideas of Japan well into the early 20th century, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Today, our speaker is Robert Wicks, PhD, a cast member, professor of art history at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and director of the Miami University Art Museum. He was a Fulbright lecturer at Silpacorn University in Bangkok, Thailand, and a visiting professor of Asian studies at Kansai Gaidak, I always wanna say Gaidaku, but Gaidai University in Osaka, Japan. And now I'll turn over the screen to Bob, Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen, and thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's been a real joy preparing this uh, particular lecture, which has to do with a, uh, an album that was recently acquired uh, by the Miami University Art Museum. If you haven't had a chance to visit the Miami University Art Museum in Oxford, uh, this is an exterior view from the Western campus from the Duck Pond. Uh, we have wonderful collections and we're open during the academic year, as well as during the day. And so uh, right now, however, it does require that people have um, online registration uh, so that we can keep track of the numbers and adhere to social distancing norms at this time. So what are we gonna be talking about today and looking forward to the discussion afterwards as well is uh, Beato's photographic views and costumes of Japan as was mentioned. And there are several topics that I'm, I'd like to deal with. First is to discuss uh, the history of early photography because it's so different from what we're used to today with our digital lenses and so forth. Uh, and then Beato before Japan, the opening of Yokohama as a treaty port, as Helen mentioned, uh, Beato's arrival and his work in Japan and specifically uh, one album or one type of album that he produced uh, called Photographic Views and Costumes of Japan, and then just briefly about his legacy at the end. Now, uh, there are still some uncertainties uh, about precisely when uh, Beato was born, uh, but he was either in Venice or Corfu, um, but it isn't certainly known. But here are two photographs that were taken of him while he was in Japan, and he became known there as Count Collodian de Policastro, and we'll find out later. Uh, why that is the case. Uh, so again, he first came to prominence with his uh, war uh, scenes, uh, first of the Crimean War, then later with the, Indi the Sepoy Mutiny in India and the Second Opium War in Japan. He then uh, worked with uh, Wordman in uh, Yokohama and then established his studio there. Unfortunately, a major fire destroyed much of Yokohama, as well as many of his negatives in 1866, made it necessary for him to then uh, go back and reshoot a lot of the images. Uh, but uh, fortunately, some of the early ones did survive. And you can see here his various addresses uh, on, uh, in Yokohama and the F. Beato and Company photographers, as he became known toward the end of the period that we're dealing with. So he honed his craft really through war photography, and especially as we'll see the um, panorama. Now, first though, we need to look a little bit at the history of photography. The first photograph on the left of your screen uh, dates to 1826. And it's, you can see it's a hardened bitumen on pewter. The, the exposure took probably all day. Uh, so people aren't shown there because the emulsion was not that sensitive. Uh, however, Nietzsche then worked with uh, Louis Daguerre, and after Nietzsche's death in 1833, Daguerre continued to experiment, resulting in the first commercially viable photographic process known as the daguerreotype, 
which was announced in 1839. From the middle image there uh, by Honoré Daumier, you'll notice that um, the daguerreotype process was quite cumbersome. There are usually braces behind the heads of the figures to keep them still because initially it took more than a minute uh, to uh, achieve an image. And then later they would then reduce it just a few seconds or even to one second or so. So the process very quickly uh, established itself and improved. So the early photography, uh, the garotype was silver plated sheet copper, and it becomes known as a cased photograph, as you can see there, to protect the image. The daguerreotypes are placed in a small frame with a mat and glass cover, and so they're called cased photographs. One detraction, of course, is that each image is unique, and so that it's not easy uh, to uh, make duplicates of a particular image. There were other competitors, such as the calotype on paper, but the daguerreotype ultimately won out. In order to produce a photograph, first, of course, you need to identify a suitable surface on which to preserve an image. In this case, uh, silver plated copper. And uh, you need to sensitize the surface. In this case, they expose the plate to iodine, uh, bromine or chlorine fumes to make the plate light sensitive. And then you need to expose it by putting it into uh, the camera. You also then need to develop and fix the image, and then you need to protect uh, the image. And I mentioned the weakness of the daguerreotype process is that each image is unique and not easily reproducible. So uh, experimentation continued, and gradually the processes of photography uh, did advance beyond the daguerreotype. And in the 1850s, a number of wet plate processes uh, were uh, introduced. The ambrotype, which you see with the woman there on the right, uh, is a, a collodion surface uh, that is cotton cellulose soaked in nitric and sulfuric acid, which is then uh, imbued with a, a chemical to make it light sensitive. And that then produces a glass uh, positive on a dart with a dark backing. So again, each image is unique. The tintype on the right, uh, which is collodion on lacquered or Japan sheet iron. Again, each image is unique. And then finally, we come to the glass plate negatives uh, where the collodion is on glass creating a negative, a printing uh, out of a uh, image is possible on a contact print that is directly next to uh, the negative itself. So there were no enlargers early on. And these were albumin silver prints. And this is the process that Beato used. So let's look briefly at the process uh, in order to understand the issues that uh, Beato was faced with uh, all throughout his photographic career. So thanks to the George Eastman House for a uh, accessible description of the process. You see one, two, three, four in the squares there, top left. Step one is to polish the glass plate to ensure that it's completely smooth and clean and there are no imperfections because those of course will show up in the negative. Step two is coating it with collodion. The photographic collodion, as I mentioned, is a mixture of raw cotton, which is treated with nitric and sulfuric acids, dissolved in ether and alcohol with a little iodide and bromide mixed in. Sounds like a great cocktail there. Uh, you pour the collodion onto a glass plate and then tilt the plate until its entire surface is, with, is coated with the solution. And then you pour the excess collodion back into its bottle. And if you've ever used chigarid, you have used collodion. It has a distinctive aroma and it sticks to virtually everything. Step three, lower left, you dip the uh, plate in silver nitrate to sensitize the plate. So you go into the dark room or if you're in the field, it uses a dark tint. And while the plate is still wet, and that's why it's called the wet plate process. While the plate is still wet, dip it into a solution that contains silver nitrate. The silver nitrate binds with the iodide and bromide to make a silver halide coating, which is sensitive to light. You then take the plate to the camera. Now, while you're still in the dark room, you insert the plate into a light proof holder, which is constricted, constructed rather 
to fit your camera. And you can see it on the lower left in this image. You take the holder to the camera and you insert it. You remove the slide in the holder that covers the glass plate, and then you're ready to expose the image. You expose the plate by removing the lens cap. This will allow light to enter the camera and strike the light sensitive collodion. Expose the plate for 20 seconds to five minutes, depending upon how fast the silver halides react to light, how much light enters through the lens, and the amount of light hitting the subject. You then replace the lens cap to end the exposure. You reinsert the holder slide, and the holder can now be safely removed from the camera and taken back to the dark room or the dark tent. At this point, you're ready to develop. And that's number four on the right. Oops, sorry. Uh, number right uh, there. You remove the glass plate from the holder and you hold it over a tray and pour the developer over the plate. Okay, and then you're fixing it. You have the grains of metallic silver that are still on the plate as are the silver halide grains not struck by light and you remove the unexposed silver halide by placing the plate in a tray of sodium thiosulfate, which acts as a fixing agent. You then are able to wash and varnish uh, the plate one last time to remove the fixing agent and dry it. To protect the delicate image, you then apply a coat of varnish to the plate. And so there you, then you have your image for the uh, negative, which you can then make a print. To make a print, the, to make an albumin silver print from a collodion negative. You float a sheet of paper in a solution of albumin, that is egg white, that contains a chloride, and you dry it. You float the paper on a solution of silver nitrate, which produces a coating of silver chloride. You then dry it once again. And with the printing frame, which you see on the left, you align the negative over the paper and then place both of them in direct sunlight and the sun will print the picture. You wash the print in water, then tone it with gold chloride and wash it again. You fix it with sodium thiosulfate and then give it a final wash and you dry it once more. The albumin silver print is now ready for trimming and framing. And that gives it this wonderful golden hue that you'll see in the images of Beato. So taking the process on the road uh, was required considerable ingenuity. You can see an individual there on the left showing the breakaway view of the tent. The typical arrangement was the photographer and an assistant here with this plate holder containing a wet plate while the photographer positions and focuses the camera. He can see an inverted image on a sandblasted glass focusing plate. And the full image of what we saw earlier, Sam A. Cooley, who was a US photographer during the Civil War, during the 1860s, uh, and his assistant is shown with the plate holder. And a photographic van used by Roger Fenton uh, in 1854 during the Crimean War. And this is his assistant is shown there seated on the front of the wagon. Fenton actually uh, was in, the, in Crimea before Beato uh, was there, but they were. Uh, close in time. The dry plate process was first introduced in 1871, and Eastman's dry gelatin dry plates were introduced at the end of the end of the decade, actually in 1880, so that Beata would not have had access to this. You'll notice in the advertisement of England's dry plates, there's a rising sun on the horizon with a smile on its face, a new day for photography. The wet plate photographers on the left shown burdened with their heavy photographic equipment and the dry plate gentlemen on the right are fresh and stylish, no assistant needed. Beato, of course, is still in the wet plate crowd. Now, as noted, Beato was an early war photographer. It's how he made his name. His photographs were displayed in Paris, in London and elsewhere, and they were widely published. His career started with James Robertson, uh, who had married Beato's sister. And it is apparent that the two men had connections that made their access to the battlefield possible. And you'll see here between 1854 and 1860 uh, that he had the Crimean War scenes, the Sepoy Mutiny scenes, as well as scenes from the Second Opium War. 
just an example of each. Uh, here he documented the macabre aftermath of the Crimean War. There are no scenes of actual battle, but you can still sense how he placed his cumbersome camera and tripod to achieve the best view. He achieved expertise in the panorama and the triangle on the lower left indicates where the two printed images were joined. You can see it's, it's somewhat hard to see otherwise, but once you see the line, uh, you, can, you can easily recognize it. In India, in Lucknow, India, showing the damage done during the Indian mutiny, the skeletons of murdered Indian rebels lie on the ground. And into the Far East, finally, Beato took the earliest surviving images of Hong Kong. In this panoramic view, you can easily see where the two pieces of the photographic paper were joined. And of course, the ships in the harbor didn't stay still for the camera. This is prior to their leaving Hong Kong for their assault on Beijing. And then he went on to Tianjin with the troops. And those are punji sticks in the ground. It's, as I took me a little while to identify them, uh, but those are absolutely horrific to can contemplate. And this is where the French uh, were able to enter the fort. And after the capture of the fort, here's one of his albumin silver prints from a glass negative. And another image from the same uh, setting, that is as he was taking, moving the camera from place to place. Here in the lower left and right, you can see the albumin coating on the print that it reflects in the camera lens uh, from the copy negative. And then the golden color, uh, which is typical of these albumin prints and an uneven trimming, which is somewhat unusual, uh, but it's mounted on cardstock, which is typical of the period with a handwritten caption. So you have either, either printed captions or handwritten captions to the images. Now the work is important in part because Beato's photographs frequently doc documented buildings and structures that are no longer extant. This is the Summer Palace at the Summer Palace near Beijing. In this case, the building was destroyed by the British as retaliation. Yokohama, of course, is the focus of today's presentation. This map or view was published less than a year after the opening of the treaty port in 1859. The world here is lined up to trade with Japan. The artist Sadahide produced over 85 prints of Yokohama and produced a visitor, gu visitor guides as well as, as his 1862 things seen and heard at the open port of Yokohama, which depicted the Western style of dress, appearance, and way of life. Notice the bluff on the top center of the panorama with vegetation above. That is the tr a tree covered hill where Beato took this panoramic view of Yokohama shown at the very top. The Japanese print shows ships from the US, the Netherlands with the horizontal red, white, and blue flag, and France, the vertical blue, white, and red. Now, Yokohama was initially a small fishing village, but it was felt to be a secure location for a treaty port following Commodore Perry, his arrival, and the opening of Japan. As noted, it was 1859 that Yokohama was finally opened as a treaty port. And by 1862, you had the military garrison established. The foreign quarter, as we'll see, was in the low-lying region in the southerly section. Uh, and in November 26, 1866, a massive fire broke out in the foreign settlement and destroyed much of the city. In 1868, the Meiji Restoration marked the continued expansion of trade through Yokohama and other treaty ports as well. This is a souvenir map with its title in English. And you can see here that Yokohama was chiefly confined to an island. The southerly portion on the left is the foreign quarter. And the northerly portion on the right is the Japanese quarter. You can also see the legation flags scattered throughout the area. This is an 1866 map just prior to the fire. The vast majority of the Japanese section was destroyed by that fire of November 26, 1866. 
Nearly 400 people died, chiefly Japanese prostitutes. A third of the foreign quarter also burned, including Beato's studio, which destroyed most of his negatives. The mixing of cultures that took place in the sales room, represented here by another print by Sadahide. And some of the first of Yokohama, that is the first English language newspaper in Japan, the Japan Herald, the first European style horse racing, cricket, the first locally produced ice cream, beer, rugby, a daily newspaper in 1870, gas lamps, and finally a railway to connect Yokohama to Tokyo in 1872. Now we recognize why he took on the epithet of Count Collodian. Both portraits, as noted earlier, were taken while he was in Japan. Now he came to Japan at the behest of Charles Workman, who is an, a, the illustrator for the uh, Illustrated London News. And, the, and you can see here where they formed a partnership in 1864, Beato and Workman, artists and photographers. Uh, notice that he puts Beato's name first, Okay, no doubt because of his prominence already at this time as a major war photographer. And 1866, the fire destroys his negatives and then is addressed 24A in Yokohama in 1868 and by 1870, number 17 on the Bund uh, in Yokohama and of course his name as a photographic studio. The 1866 fire raises a key issue in the history of photography. The image would have been taken at a particular point in time, of course, and prints can be made from the negative until it is no longer usable or is destroyed. A challenge for photo historians is determining both the date of the original photographic negative and when a particular print from that negative was made. Copy negatives can also be made from a high quality print, further complicating the history of an image. But we'll get to that part later. So Charles Wordman, here he is. Uh, he was famous for his sketches, of course, and he produced a Japanese sketchbook. And he also created the Jap Japan Punch um, as a kind of offshoot of the Punch uh, journal in Britain. So here you go, the Japan Punch from 1865. It was produced both as a woodcut uh, as well as lithographs on paper. So a very, very appealing and engaging and personal uh, approach to understanding Japan. One of the illustrations is quite revealing. This is called, this is from the Japan Punch of 1866. It's called Photography Under Difficulties or the Bill Broker's Attack, which you can see at the very top of uh, the image there. And the title says it's all. The work of photography was not cheap. These large expenses uh, that were required for the plates, for the chemicals, for the paper, all of which had to be imported, uh, as well as the potential for massive income, as we will see. And here he has a detail of that section. You can see again, the portrait of Beato on the right, uh, where he's holding his camera and tripod. Now, Beato was not the only photographer in Japan at time. And here's a, uh, a Japanese print by Utagawa Yoshikazu uh, called Furansu, which literally means French, but it oftentimes is simply used to refer to a foreigner uh, of a French photographer and a European woman taking a photograph. Although this image is sometimes identified as with Beato, uh, it was, however, published in 1861, which would have been two years prior to his arrival in Yokohama. So that even though Beato was not the only foreign photographer to work in Japan at this time, he was certainly the most successful during the period of 1863 to 1873. And Ishida Yunen also experimented with Western printmaking techniques. And in this case of copper plate engraving, uh, that he produced while retaining kind of the Japanese sensibilities as well as the Japanese cartouche for the title of the work. Notice it says copying from life, taking a photograph. It's at the Chionin Temple uh, in Kyoto. And then the detail you can see here shows the inverted image on the focusing screen of the camera. Uh, and you note the Netherlands flag flying at the left of the temple. It's meant to represent 
at the 1872 International Exposition that was held there. As we'll see, Beato also photographed the temple. Following the 1866 fire, Beato traveled throughout Japan taking new views. And this advertisement would date the photographic views and costumes of Japan no earlier than 1870. And this appeared in the Japan Weekly Mail of February 2nd, 1870. Uh, here you can see the locations of Beato's photographic studios at number 17 on the Boon and number 24A. And fortunately, there has survived a price list. And you can see here, it says Japan albums complete $200. Had Japan half albums, so complete means uh, 100 images. So $2 a, at a, for an image. Japan half albums at $100. Views of Japan each image $2, similarly Levant, China, and India. And the, those three categories, so Levant, China, India, of course, made him famous. The half albums, again, would contain 50 images, complete albums, 100. And he would have been paid in Spanish American silver dollar sized coins, such as you see in the top middle, a Spanish mill dollar. By 1870, Japan was minting its own dollar coins, the one yen piece you see there. Uh, and the Ichibugin on the far left, uh, which simply means one unit uh, of silver, uh, were traded at three per dollar. So he would get his silver in any number of forms. So silver was both a medium of exchange, and it's, of course, what made the photographic process possible, so both areas. And it turns out that Bayato also speculated on the Japanese silver exchange, uh, which ultimately he would lose his. Uh, funds as a result. Now, Beato had at least two cameras. You see on the lower left, it says you can do a large portrait for $15 and a uh, even larger portrait for $25. Uh, so that there's seven and a half, seven by nine inch camera and a 10 by 15 inch plate camera, which corresponds to the size of the negative resulting in contact prints that would be slightly smaller when trimmed. And that's an important point as we begin looking at these images further on. It's also critical to realize that when you, when you had the uh, advertisement here, you'll notice it says, he begs to announce to the public of Yokohama and travelers visiting the East generally, right? That is foreigners that had a lot of money. And in fact, $2, if you were to have those silver dollars today, each one would be roughly 19 to $20. So you're talking about $40 equivalent today for a single print by Beato. That's an incredibly high price to pay, but it was of course seen to be worth it at the time. Here's an example of one of the finished albums from the Hood Museum of Art and a typical spread. This is not always followed. Uh, some images lack a printed caption, having instead, as I noted earlier, a written description below the print. And you'll notice that the print and the description are on different folios. So if an album is disbound, the association of law is lost, which in fact is the case for the Miami University Art Museum photographs. The Miami University Art Museum's most recent purchase and would have been taken with Beato's 10 by 15 inch camera and then trimmed to size. It consists of 42 mounted prints. Most of the images are roughly nine and a half by 11 and a half inches. 19 of them are hand colored, which we'll see is, is an innovation that Beato took great advantage with uh, of, and then also 16 of them are vignetted. Unfortunately, they're just bounded from an album, but it's an, an advantage to museums because that way we can exhibit the prints more readily. And then there's the tipped in letterpress descriptive text on the verso and the letterpress studio label that you see above and in detail right here. And so this one, this studio label is printed on pinkish cardstock, photographic views and costumes of Japan by F. Beato and company, Yokohama, which represents his, again, his later uh, firm name as we saw before. Only one other letterpress label has been reported. The same imprint on greenish stock, however on greenish stock in this case, it's at the George Eastman House in New York, in Rochester, New York. 
Now, reported intact albums of the photographic views and costumes of Japan are these. You can see the Hood Museum with 50, Smith College with 50 prints, Merdeekson House with 51, the New York Public Library with 77, and the Getty Museum with 99. Notice the groupings. Most are the $100 so-called half album, uh, and significantly the Eastman House album with 51 is actually a hybrid with Beato and non-Beato images. And only one double album is known, the Victoria at the Victoria and Albert Museum with about 200 images. So there are three important takeaways. One, while the albums might all have the same title, no two are identical, indicating the purchasers, purchasers selected those images that meant the most to them from their visit to Japan. Second, the album was then compiled with the labels affixed opposite the image, so they were all produced custom. And third, the popularity of each image varied dramatically, illustrated by the number of duplicate images within this group of albums. So what I did is I went through each of the albums and determined which items were duplicated, and I brought those in uh, to show you today. So you can see those that have one, dupl one duplicated mean it's only in one other album, if there are more, then of course it's in more than one other album. And you'll see how the each of the prints actually varies slightly one from the other due to the printing out process. So let's begin with his views of Japan. As we'll see, Beato had the unusual ability for a foreigner to travel throughout much of Japan. Precisely how he acquired permission to do so is not entirely clear. No doubt he had diplomatic connections. Charles Wergman, for instance, recorded in mid-1863, quote, my house is inundated with Japanese officers who come to see Signor Beato's photographs, end quote. And this is an as yet unidentified view of a Japanese village. And I've included our accession number at the bottom if you ever want to go to see them at the Miami University Art Museum on your own. Leaving Yokohama, Beata would have first traveled 20 miles to the Northeast to reach Edo, modern day Tokyo. At that time, Edo was already a major metropolis with a population of more than a million people. This is the Sensoji, the Asakusa Kanon Temple in Tokyo. Completed in 645, it is Tokyo's oldest temple. And it's interesting choice for a view. It probably has to do with the fact that this is where he was able to set up uh, his camera, although you can see the pagoda there, which of course is one of the iconic elements of it. This is the Hood Museum of Art album with the mini essay on the left, which refers to, but does not name the Asakusa Kanon image. And there further down, you can see there's a reference to King of the Beggars, uh, which probably provided inspiration for Kawabata's the Scarlet Gang of Asakusa. And on to Kamakura, to the southwest. This is a view of Kamakura taken in 1863, while Beato accompanied a French visitor to Japan. This is a rare pre-1866 image from, an Im from a negative that survived the Yokohama fire. This is the same spread from the George Eastman house. And then the label, again, it does not relate directly to the image. The same label could be used for multiple views. And here it serves as the Asakusa example as a general guide for visitors to the locale. A handwritten description on the lower right of the print it's uncertain exactly when that was added. However, the red hand-ruled border on the card mount is a common feature of many of Beato's exterior views. And if you look at the left uh, in the detail there, you can see that there are three non-Japanese seated on the steps. At least one is likely the French visitor, Aimé Humbert. The George Eastman house, image has the same red ruled border. And when the 1863 image was used in an 1870 publication, Le Jabon Illustré, uh, the international visitors were removed by the engraver, making it more 
exotic. This is also in Kamakura. This is the Tahoto, a two-tiered esoteric Buddhist pagoda called the Daito, dedicated to Yakushi, the medicine Buddha, at the Shinto Hachiman Shrine, who's the god of war, protector of Japan, before the separation of Buddhism and Shinto in 1868, following the Meiji Restoration. The Daito was subsequently destroyed, and this is one of the few surviving images showing the finial uh, removed. And it's often been colorized for a lot of current day discussions of the site. And Japanese engaged uh, in worship at the Daito there, the details. So the details are wonderful as you can get up close and personal to the image. To the Sakawa River on the Tokaido, the river crossing on the Tokaido connecting Edo and Tokyo, a red ruled border once again. And this is one of the few hand tinted exterior views. This is a 16 porter litter or palanquin. You can see the uh, actually four or even five individuals who are seated uh, on top and they have all those carriers behind, below. And the Getty album, and then the uh, essay, you can see the more a more extraordinary mode of locomotion cannot well be conceived than the one depicted in the adjoining photograph, of course. And this one is specific uh, to that image. And they talk again more about uh, that there as a way of giving information to the viewer as they have gone home. You'll notice in the lower right, I've circled a scratch in the emulsion which is shown here in the New York Public Library version. And it was not caught when they were developing the print in this instance. The Getty Museum example, it's somewhat disguised. And then it's nearly gone in the Miami University Art Museum print. This, of course, the scene would have been known to Beato, not only through uh, the popularity of the crossing, but also through prints like this one by Hiroshige, who included the Sakawa River crossing in his 1833, 34, 53 stations of the Tokaido. And it was the likely inspiration, of course, for the popularity of the scene. We now go toward Mount Fuji. This is my favorite image uh, in the entire portfolio. You can see Mount Fuji just beginning to peek through uh, the mist there. And unfortunately, it's not found in the other images, so I've not yet been able to identify this precise location. Going now to Kyoto, an early capital of Japan and major Buddhist center. And here we go to the Shuedo Assembly Hall at Shioni in Kyoto. That was earlier uh, in the engraving by Yunnan. This building was reconstructed, reconstructed in 18, 1635 with an area said to equal some 1,000 tatami mats. And this hall also served as the site for the great Kyoto exhibition in 1872. And this image was probably taken in that year. If you look more closely, you can see there's the pencil inscription in the lower right, the temple at Chionin, Kyoto, in which the exhibition was held, 1872. And further, a foreigner can be seen at the entrance to the pavilion. And the presence of this image in the Miami album would indicate that it would have been produced no earlier than 1872, 1873. The first Kyoto exhibition or exposition, it was off as referred to in 1872. This is from the Illustrated London News. Uh, and it shows here individuals, specifically Japanese, enjoying uh, the exhibition and looking at samurai armor on the lower left and right. Now we go to Nagasaki in the far south, which is another treaty port, and Beato probably journeyed there by ship. A cemetery, again, the red hand-ruled border, and, some on, and here you can see it here uh, with the caption, this is looked upon as the aristocratic burying ground of Nagasaki, and the enclosing walls shown bound small spaces in which the dead of one family repose and going on talking about the tombstones and so forth. 
And beyond this, there are a number of unidentified scenes for now, uh, but I'll just briefly go through them. The residents of a daimyo, probably barracks on the right. A temple, a Buddhist temple. Another temple here. A castle scene. And trees planted probably along the Tokaido to provide shade for the traveler. And so you can see several palanquins visible on the road on the left there. We now move to Beato's depictions of people. This is an unidentified colorist, this image not in our collection, but it illustrates two important features of Beato's work. First, he employed colorists who would have been highly skilled in Japanese sumi -e painting, and he frequently used the vignette to soften the images. So basically vignetting is where they would use a card such as on the lower left or the left or the right there with a large oval uh, in order to uh, continue exposing the main part of the print for those areas that they want to leave unexposed, they would have the card stock there. Keeping in mind that this is more complicated than even using this typical dodging and burning uh, when you have it in larger, but when you're doing it in the sun, uh, you have, there are many more factors that have to be taken into account. Many of his costume images were posed in the studio, such as this one, which is identified as officers of the Paiban show. One is reading a Western style book. They're seated in a Western chair, which you can see the wheels on the bottom for ease of movement within the studio. Uh, and of course it's hand colored. Uh, and the vignette, of course, would have been created by holding a large card with an oval opening above the print as it was exposed to light. Some of them, his images of costumes of Japan were taken outdoors. Here you can see the typical vertical composition of the print and the same negative printed horizontally in the New York Public Library. This is a mendicant nun. Again, she's posed in the studio. You see the tatami mat and the uh, wall behind her, which is repeated in most of the images, as well as nicely colorized. And it's interesting to note that the caption that goes with this image, that the writer would say Kempfer, who lived in Japan from 1683 to 1693. According to Kempfer, these nuns live under the protection of the nunneries at Kamakura and Kyoto and so on. And they're held to be some of the more beautiful women because they would get more uh, as they were out collecting alms. Another example, the same print in the Getty Museum. And if you look at the feet, uh, the proper left foot, you can see how the prints vary slightly. This is from the National Gallery of Art and Smith College where her foot is nearly, the toes are nearly gone. Uh, there. And the coloration varies slightly from one to the other, which implies that there were multiple colorists uh, that were in, under the employ of Beato. The, re the sumo wrestlers, again, a posed studio shot. Notice the top Tommy mat and the wall in the background. And then a description of the sumo wrestling process. A similar print from the Getty Museum, but again, only one. Probably the most popular image uh, of Beato's photographs of the, from this grouping of images is this. It's called At Her Toilet. And it's having to do with the young girl with two mirrors seeing whether her back hair is all right. Japanese women have their hair dressed by professional hairdressers every other day or once in three days as their means may admit. And they goes on to solve these, for all of these explicit rules are laid down in the book called Ona Daigaku, or the complete duty of woman, literally great learning of woman. 
The inspiration, of course, for this would have been something like Kitagawa Utamaro's uh, woman using two mirrors to observe her coiffure. And it's important to compare the two images, the Beato image on the left, the Utamaro on the right. And in the, in the Utamaro on the right, the positioning of the mirror allows her to actually view the nape of her neck and hair dressing. Uh, and the woodblock print medium allows the artist also to show her face in the mirror, creating a focal point for the viewer. The Beato image, on the other hand, while it mimics the Utamaro scene with the mirror stand and lacquer chest, as well as a small porcelain bowl, there's an added cast iron teapot at the right, which is nearly disappearing in the vignette. The positioning of the mirrors, however, make it impossible for her to examine the back of her neck and hair. And we certainly can't see her face reflected in the mirror. So it evokes this particular moment, this particular element of uh, making up and the toilet, but it certainly doesn't reproduce it fully accurately. And the teapot is clearly visible in the Getty Museum print and in the National Gallery of Art print and here in the Smith one. Now, later Japanese photographers would reproduce the same scene. Kusakabe Kimbe, who served as one of Beato's colorists and photographic assistants before opening his own studio in 1881, you can see here, he noticed the inclusion of the inventory number and title in the negative on the lower right, which is typical of the work uh, from the 1890s onward. Again, you can also see that uh, he's evoking uh, Beato as opposed to uh, the earlier print uh, that we saw, because again, you can't really see behind the head of the woman as she's examining her hair. Another number 340 called Dressing Hair. And a second very popular image is that of a partial reenactment of an execution scene. Again, done in the safety of the photographic studio, uh, while the label doesn't make that clear. Uh, the view of Mount Fuji is in the background, which is part of a painted uh, backdrop in the studio. This talks about uh, the decapitation by means of a sword is the most common form of capital punishment in Japan, and that this particular executioner uh, received as many as 350 heads in a 12 month, and so 350 executions in a year. And that even though he receives uh, considerable funds, about $2.30 per head, uh, his office is a despised one. And it's a very popular image uh, demonstrated by the fact that the same print is found on several of the surviving albums, along with significant emulsion loss in the lower left and right corners of the image. You can see where it goes brown in the lower left and right there uh, from improper handling. You can see it here, the Getty Museum, again with the emulsion loss, and the New York Public Library, again with the emulsion loss there as well. Now, these are close up details from Beato's photographs of Japan. It's from MIT's Visualizing Cultures Project, which is uh, photographic views of Japan with historical and descriptive notes uh, that uh, is partly uh, has been very, very helpful in producing this particular presentation. So in addition to providing some of the most dramatic photographs of early Meiji Japan, Beato's legacy as a photographer ranges from his battlefield images, his early success of producing photographic panoramas, and introducing a realistic colorizing process to his black and white images. All of these were incredibly significant and influential innovations that were followed by later photographers. We noted earlier that Beato was responsible for providing a proving ground for at least one major Japanese photographer, Kusakabe Kimbe. As noted, Kimbe worked in his studio as well as his successor, Baron Raimund von Stilfried, as a photographic colorist and assistant, and in 1881, opened his own workshop in Yokohama. By 1893, 
Kimbe was one of the leading Japanese studios supplying art uh, to Western customers. And this is an image by Kimbe. We have an example of this uh, in the Miami University Art Museum collection. This is much more refined than Beato's image of the women with the two mirrors and Kimbe's imitation of that scene. And here, Kimbe, of course, is more sensitively drawing upon Japanese cultural norms. The final image is this one, a shrine to Jizo at Hakone on the shore of Lake Ashinoko on the Tokaido Road. Jizo, of course, is the protector of travelers and children. He's capable of transversing the six realms and to assist individuals in limbo to reach Amida's Western paradise. And shrines dedicated to Jizo are often found along pilgrimage routes. So this is the Miami Art Museum image. And here at the Hood Museum with the description of the Jizo called Jizo Sama or Jizo uh, with the modern transcription and talking about his aspects there that are important to recognize. And then Beato sold his negatives to Baron Raimund von Stillfried uh, in 1877 and ostensibly gave up photography, although only temporarily. He left Japan in 1883, having lost his money speculating on the silver exchange the year before. And he died in Florence in 1908. Many of his photographers, uh, many photographers copied the images without attribution. In this case, Stillfried added the location in the lower left of the image of the negative. It says Hakone, there you can see in white, uh, together with an image number, number 339, which I've uh, circled for ease of location, on the lower left base of the shrine lantern. And as you can see from the watermark, the digital watermark there, this image is still available today through Alami for a price. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Uh, this image, of course, is one of the early images by Beato that was done prior to 1866. It's probably my favorite of his entire Japan portfolio. This is the image that's in this, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And if I ever have an opportunity to purchase one for the art museum, I would certainly do so. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Bob. Why don't you just leave that one up on the screen? Oh, okay. Uh, I will, I'll, so I'll go back. If we get we get the questions, you can uh, refer okay. back to it. Oh, we had a discussion going on the side. Um, um, by, full disclosure to anybody that's wa watching the chat window is that uh, my husband's a professional photographer. Mm. Steve, so there were some questions from Nagus about, um, let's see, start at the top. Okay. Do, 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 do. Were the war prints, how were the war prints received in the West? Were they published in news magazines? Uh, they're published in several different ways or a couple of different ways. One uh, by simple exhibition, that is they, were, they have the actual prints that will be put on display. In addition, when you have the first, you have, this is about the same time when you have some of the first actual photographs being printed in newspapers, uh, but also there are uh, line engravings done after the photographs were how they were also published. So uh, at least three different ways that they became known. And because of um, the sort of the newness of it, uh, they were also widely uh, appreciated. So yes, the, the reception would have been very, very positive. Mm -hmm. Just to, to add a little context, when Nagas asked the question, we were on the situation um, showing the war photographs. Oh, okay. At that time, they didn't have a way of reproducing half tones in, in, uh, on, on a printing press. So those if printed would have been done uh, as engravings and, and as in one of the later ones that you showed. And I did some quick looking up and it turns out that the first reproduced halftone on a printing press would have happened in about 1860. Uh, and the process didn't become more common until some improved methods right. came along. And so he would have been too early for that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's great to know. Mm -hmm. No, okay. Then we had some questions about hand tinting. And uh, 
I think Bob, you already brought out that uh, they actually used the artists that did uh, woodblock prints to do a lot of the coloring. Um, and they, yeah, and they would have widely, I mean, these, obviously I think it's one of the advantages of, of the fact that Beato was working in Japan is that, you know, already having a calligraphic tradition through calligraphy, through the regular writing, uh, and that there have been a large stable of well-trained artists uh, available to him uh, who would want the work, as right. opposed to the West, which would have been a much more difficult time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we are mostly familiar with hanging scrolls and things like that by very famous artists, but there were um, just commoners and craftsmen that would do a lot of uh, hanging scrolls for people's homes, for tea ceremonies, for tokonoma. Uh, so yes, there was a um, large a wealth of artists and craftspeople that could do the hand tinting, which is kind of pretty. Yeah, um, and I think it's important to point out, which I didn't in the, in the talk, but the, the, these were the very transparent watercolors, you know, that, uh, and I haven't looked into whether or not these are just the standard uh, colors available, you know, to the Japanese or if they imported them as well. But my, my gut feeling is that these would have been simply those that were available locally. Right, but they had started to um, import Berlin blue in the 1820s. Mm, that early, okay. That early, because Hokusai's publisher used it for 36 views of Mount Fuji. That's right, that's right. And then a lot of publishers would use it for the blues and the Bokashi on, on prints. Then uh, the aniline dyes came with um, the open tree ports and uh, they, they don't, well, if you look at woodblock prints, those aniline dyes don't, um, <laughs> they don't last very long. They get, they get pretty ugly. Mm -hmm. um, so the earlier prints with the natural colors, which look like to me, what's in the photographs are much more beautiful and their colors stay true a lot longer. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Let's see more. Sometimes the prints were toned and Bob mentioned that with gold. Um, okay, how did the museum acquire the album? Oh, that's a great question. This is, this is one of those serendipitous moments that was totally unexpected. Um, we were preparing for an exhibition. Uh, we do what we call a senior capstone in our history where undergraduates work with works in the permanent collection to develop a theme together with a faculty member who's a specialist and then our curatorial staff. And they work on that in the fall and then the spring is when the exhibition actually occurs. In this instance, we're working with Professor Mike Hatch um, and who is a specialist in Chinese painting history, but he wanted to look at the interaction of East and West in the 19th century. And I said, well, I've, I'll begin looking for things. And there was an auction at uh, Cowan's in Cincinnati but because I'm also interested in, in the history of photography and the uh, it was American photography was the theme of the auction. And uh, but it had one lot in of the several hundred uh, that was of Japanese photo photographs. And it was these this these images by Beato. So I put my bid in as which started as one half the low estimate and waited and waited Waited and no one else bid on the lot. So I was able to purchase this wonderful portfolio uh, for one half of the low estimate. Uh, it's the one secret is, is that with Cowan's and many other auction houses, sometimes they have a, an internal um, auction platform that they use that's not accessible to the internet generally. So that if you did a search for Beato auction, whatever, uh, it would not have come up. Uh, but in this case, because I was following his uh, history of photography auctions all the time, we were able to acquire uh, this wonderful group of prints. Okay, then we had another question about some of the prints get lighter on the edge. Um, and do you know how that happened? That's, that's a good question. Let's see if I can see a couple examples here. Uh, part of it, in this case, for instance, you can see the change in coloration. Uh, part of it 
most of in this instance probably has to do with the fact that they are glued down to cardstock. So it's not just the print on paper, but it's also the interaction of uh, the original chemicals in the paper, the, uh, as well as the glue that is used uh, on, on the, uh, to adhere it to the cardstock. And that combined with uh, various exposure to just atmosphere and light. So all of those factors come together in determining uh, what the print looks like today. So they're fairly close to what they would have been originally, but there is some toning that goes on as a result of age, the aging process. Now, we have some old photographs that are mounted on cardboard and they, they have a little bit of a, a curve to them. And yes. Steve had a guess that if it was mounted in an album, the album would, wouldn't have sit, sat straight right. and maybe uh, light came in from the sides. Uh, that's possible. Part of it here, in this case, um, these prints from the 1860s, um, the cardstock on which they're mounted is very, very thin. Uh, the oh. cardstock of the later ones from 1880s, 1890s, it's, it's really heavy, you know, um, and uh, it's almost like an artist board that they were using later on. But these earlier ones were thinner, so they tended to lay flat. But you may have noticed when we looked at the, uh, I think was the, the Hood album, uh, that there's a slight waviness. Uh, so due to moisture and whatever else, so they never laid completely flat. That's yeah. right. There would have been acts. There could have been air or light uh, that that was impacting the the longevity of the image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Diane, you raised your hand. Diane Fisher. Well, I don't. I did. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can. Hi, Diane. Oh, so I collect boro. And I've been doing it for like 25 years when it started being popular. And it's exciting to me on some of your pieces when I enlarge the figures mm -hmm. that it's sort of poor people oh, that yeah. you're seeing photographs of. And right, I've right. never, ever seen that before. I've only seen the more formal paintings or the prints and then you know, if you look at their feet, I was really interested in what their sandals looked like in poverty. So for me, some of these were just so exciting because they fit with some of the cloth that I have, even though I know my cloth is li probably later than some of it. But, yeah. you know, even the poorer people had the same exact style. It didn't really change. That, that's, a, that's a great observation, Diane. And I, and I think what I haven't shown, I mean, obviously I wasn't able to show all of the images in the portfolio, but there are at least, I would say, at least a half dozen images that are would fit in the costume area or kind of a combination of exterior scene, costume area, yeah. uh, where, they, where he does show the less affluent. That is the, like the street urchins that we saw earlier on. Right. Uh, did show today, uh, which is quite unusual. Uh, for for uh, this particular period. Wow. Yeah. I think they're just wonderful. Mm. Yeah, it'd be kind of fun since we're recording this to uh, go on to YouTube and stop the YouTube and look more closely at some of the images to get a better idea of, uh, you know, just our favorite images. So for Diane, it would be the, the ones of the poor people. And I agree. Um, mm. And with my research on Japan, um, uh, yeah, the poor people often went barefoot. Um, they, they, they didn't bother with the sandals or the getta, um, which is interesting. Um, question for Margaret. Did Beato ever do photos used in stereotopic viewers? Uh, I have, popular? yeah, this, this is a pre-stereo view pretty much. Um, and the fact that he was, there's been a lot of question about, you know, did, did he only have one camera? And there's, there's a famous phrase that says he only purchased one lens, uh, but the <laughs> same lens could be used in different camera bodies. Uh, but he had one, one lens that we know of. And as you saw from the price list, he had at least two different cameras, two different format and sizes uh, based on the size of the negative. But uh, beyond that, I have seen no evidence that he experimented with uh, stereo views. In the United States at this particular time in the 1860s, uh, of course, we do have st the stereo view coming into its own, but pretty much 
uh, what frequently happened is the experimentation there, if I recall correctly, is really later in the 1860s, into the 1870s, especially, uh, but not necessarily this early. This was still in the it's kind of a single lens mode. As a, as a practical matter, you could theoretically make a stereographic photo with one camera by mm -hmm. offsetting it, taking a picture once, then offsetting it, the right. camera by the distance between pers a person's eyes. But with a camera that's almost 11 by 14 inches, how are you going to view the thing? <laughs> <laughs> the stereographs that you see are very much smaller, and they, they probably were taken with a specialized camera with two lenses. Right, right. Yeah, actually, I think I've seen photos of that somewhere in our books up there, honey. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Peg's question was the last one, unless anybody else is going to put their hand up or type in a question. I'll shoot off my mouth while we're waiting for them to type. Okay, that's um, <laughs> you, you made an interesting suggestion, and that is to, to be able to stop the images um, on the, the video that we'll release on YouTube and whatnot. But uh, Bob, I'm wondering if it would be possible to produce, to give us a PDF that we could post with, with higher resolution images. Oh, sure, I'd be happy to. That would be fabulous. Mm -hmm. Now, would it be a PDF of the, just of the PowerPoint presentation? That would be fine. Uh, either that or PDFs of the images. I guess the, images. Yeah, I think the images would be easier. Sure, I can do that. Fabulous. That'd be great. And we can just post it on the website and give people the uh, information when, whenever it becomes available. Mm -hmm. We usually can get the YouTube up by Tuesday. So Wednesday. So, oh, I, have, I do have another question from Charles. Is it known how many photographs of the Yuan Ming Yuan, the Yuan Ming Yuan still mm -hmm. exist and where they might be published? That's a great question. Um, mm -hmm. I do not know the answer to that. I haven't researched it directly, um, but uh, I do have a funny, well, no, anyway, to the related to the Summer Palace, um, won't tell it. All right, no, I'm, I'm not aware. And uh, that would be an interesting project to determine where, where the, uh, the images are and how many there have survived. Right. Mm -hmm. Home, are you still on? And if you do, if you are, can you unmute mute yourself because you've been to the Taipei yeah. Museum. Yes, I'm here, but I don't know the answer either. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Homei was uh, trained to Taipei, uh, the Taipei Museum, Taipei University. Right, right, so right. She, if anybody would be familiar with what's in Taiwan, I think she would know, so, okay. Okay. Well, I would say we're going to wrap up the official recording of this and thank Bob very much so for being part of our um, virtual online lectures to help us keep together and help keep us learning about Asian culture. And I'm going to pause for a minute while we thank stop you. the recording. Oh, Helen? Yeah. Uh, this is Emmy. I just have a quick question. I forgot to write it down. Okay. Uh, uh, how popular were these photographers um, and these photos? People who maybe started to collect, uh, were they able to see it and give them some ideas as what's what's over there? Uh, th that's an, a great, great point. It is what was the audience, what kind of market yeah, uh, right. there was. And in this case, because keep in mind that this is prior to, as Steve pointed out, prior to the point where uh, photograph viewers or things like that were available, our half tones were available to be printed in newspapers and magazines and so on. So they would actually have to view uh, the original photograph. And the photograph would be available either you know, as an individual print or occasionally as tipped into a published book and so forth. But it was highly um, intensive in terms of the, the process, just the physicality of making the images and then making them available. So in this instance, as you saw from the advertisement, that uh, people, these were aimed at individuals who actually visited Japan, came to Yokohama, visited his shop, selected images that would give them the best memories of their time in Japan. So these would have been highly, uh, very wealthy, well-to-do individuals. Uh, and, and not, not simply your person in the street. And then they would, these albums would then become prized possessions 
back home in the United States and elsewhere where they would be like the equivalent of a coffee table book. And they would then be uh, shared uh, with the visitors to the home. So that essentially would be the process of how they became known. And then later through publication, uh, through the, the engravings as we saw, uh, which were often in the news magazines and elsewhere. So his name was associated with those images. Uh, it would say, you know, based on a photo, after a photograph by F. Uh, Beato, uh, things like that. And then his name would continue to receive recognition. So then uh, 40 or 50 years later, someone like Freer, would he be aware of them? Yes, yes. And they were then highly, they were then became highly collectible and even more so now, um, today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, we have uh, one cast member that I know the family has um, an album. And I'm not, I've seen it, but I don't remember if it's Beato or Kusakabe, um, but I could ask. Um, I don't know how long they've had it or how they acquired it, but it's quite a treasure to that family. Mm. Mm. Wonderful. Yeah. We bought our photos um, through a dealer here in town. Uh, I don't think they were, they don't look like they were part of an album unless the cardboard's been trimmed. So I think pe people might've been able just to buy one or two, maybe sure, three sure. photos, what you could afford. I mean, consider yeah. again, $2 an image, that's a lot of money back then. Oh, that is for sure. That is for sure. Okay, Nagas has put up, uh, of course, you can always find a lot on uh, artsandculturegoogle.com. And maybe I ought to put that up on the CAST website um, because it is a fabulous. Uh, I know the Cincinnati Art Museum is up on that too. Um, yes, yes. Arts and culture, Google. okay, there we go. I'll put that up for everybody as a resource. And again, <laughs> we'll wrap this up for the recording and um, wait a moment or two and we can have our virtual reception. So anybody who wants to stay around and just talk to Bob, ask questions, talk to each, each other, please feel free to do, to, do so. Thank you. Thank you.